And welcome to another Nothing Like a Good Book. I look forward to doing this show. And uh, I have a very interesting uh, artist, uh, indeed an artist, and a, an author with uh, 12 books under under his skin already. And you've no doubt heard of him, Ishinobu. I want to talk about a natural history of humanity and a prophetic post-mortem. Their end was death by a thousand self-imposed cuts. In the far future, alien scholars from a nearby galaxy discover Earth. Well, we're reading a lot about that lately and seeing a lot about that. A beautiful planet with the ruins and records of an ancient global civilization. So, what would they say about humanity? What might they see influenced this ape from the very beginning and thereby set the trajectory of their history? What would a post-mortem examination reveal about the causes of their demise? In this revealing new book, The Story of Humanity, Ecology and Consequence, scholar Ishinobu uses this objective viewpoint to frame his natural history of humanity. Big pleasure. Welcome, Ishi. Welcome to Nothing Like a Good Book. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the interview. Well, um, this is your 12th book now. You've written comprehensively about the sciences on spirituality. What were you wanting to do with this book? As you said, this is a natural history book. It is a work that is written as a retrospective, but of course, as you mentioned, it the last chapter is a prophecy. It's a forensic analysis of why humanity has pursued the path from a social standpoint that it has pursued. Hmm. It's a, as, as you know, it's a, a complex tale. We had, humans had tremendous promise and they have not fulfilled that promise. Instead, they've gone in their least direction, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Y- you, you do share that the futuristic sci-fi setting makes the storyline you know, unequivocal. Human history has been a continuum of civilization, uh, an unwavering vector. From the perspective of the present, the book's conclusion is a prophecy that uh, self-extinction uh, extinction is impending. You know, but, uh, but that is just the takeaway. It's not the content. Yes. The content is um, the how and why uh, we have come to where we are now. Well, I'm going to tell you, early in the game, Jessica Tofina, she's an educator, highly respected writer. She gives this five stars, Issue No Booze, the story of humanity, ecology, and consequence. It's not just a prophetic view of a future post-mortem that could be conducted on humanity, but also a masterful weaving together of history, philosophy, and psychology that gives insight into our current predicament. Those who are curious... So, listeners, if you are curious about how humanity got to this place and where the inevitable outcome of this trajectory leads, you can find the story of humanity to be revealing and enlightening, and it's highly, highly recommended. Well, that's the first one, Ishii. There's been quite a few. Um, I want to do an excerpt from the story of humanity, ecology and consequence. A dramatic shift in Earth's climate brought forth a fateful ape. A later climate drama ushered that ape's demise, the beginning owed to geology, the end to technology. This recorded human history spanned a mere 6,000 years. What we've done in this brief volume is to distill the human chronicle down to a sketch of what transpired, with emphasis on the psychology, the why of what happened. Scribes of Sculptor, Planet Signor of Beta Sculptoris, Galaxy NGC 253. What on earth is all of that? Well, uh, that's an actual uh, planet and galaxy about 1.4 light years away. The point of using that science fiction preface was to, for the reader, at least in the beginning, state that try to put the reader outside of being invested in this creature, this ape on Earth. Um, There's also, of course, the the retrospective that, uh, uh, so to speak, the deal is done. 
uh, they, if you look at it, once you get into the book, of course, you become absorbed and identify with uh, these earthers. But at this point in time, there's nothing that can be done to alter the fate of humanity. That fate is already sealed. And the book explains how they came about and why. Hmm. From the beginning to the end. So uh, is there a connecting theme or, or, or thread to your works? I mean, for example, does the story of humanity connect, say, for instance, to uh, your spokes of the wheel cycle? Of course. Uh, the spokes of the wheel cycle were, it's a comp. the spokes cycle is a comprehensive college education. Um, it covers all of the sciences, except for, of course, home economics. Um, and humanity, the story of humanity, is the natural history that covers portions of what I wrote in books uh, the, about evolution, about psychology, about sociology, in book five, The Echoes of the Mind, book six, The Fruits of Civilization, which was on economics and the impact of technology, um, and of course, book seven, The Pathos of Politics. So this book is a consilience um, with emphasis on human, basically human failings. Uh, where did we go wrong? Um, mm. and, and why did we go wrong? And the key element in all of this is that we didn't respect each other and we didn't respect nature. We, we men especially, felt they could conquer nature, and that was a common theme um, during the age of imperialism. And we still have that mentality, and that's a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. The other, of course... The other, of course, huge social mistake is that uh, women have been the jewel of humanity. Females in all animal species uh, are the dominant species in, ter in terms of, especially in altricial animals. Uh, they're responsible for child rearing uh, beyond birth. And their subjugation by men uh, has been a tremendous mistake. And there's been a huge consequence for that. Mm. Well, I mean, you've written extensively uh, with all the books that you have mentioned in, you know, in science disciplines and on spirituality in your other books. Um, what really drew you, do you think, towards writing a history book? Exactly that. I had not written a history book, and I, I wanted to. I'm a longtime fan of history. Will Durant uh, was a, a brilliant historian in the last century. Um, I don't always agree with Durant's conclusions, but he was a great scholar and writer. Um, so, of course, it would be natural for me to want to write something. And it, the Spokes books are rich with history. I cover the history of all the theories um, that came about in every one of the sciences. Uh, so it's clear that I enjoy history. Uh, this one is a blending with a focus on history, but of course, as you know from reading the book, there's a lot of science within it as well, uh, especially psychology and sociology, but also evolutionary biology. Mm. Well, Ishi, the story of humanity is told in five chapters, and the first chapter, The Fateful Ape, uh, traces the evolution of uh, hominids and outlines the traits that made them distinct from their primate predecessors. What does the reign of thought explain? The reign of thought is about the psychology of humans and how that psychology is adaptive uh, and maladaptive, um, as it turns out. Uh, the, one of the more important points in the chapter is we're an altric altricial species. Uh, we are quick to develop physically um, but slow to develop mentally. Uh, and education, therefore, is critical in creating a society that can be successful. And of course, as we know, uh, the premise of democracy is that the average person is intelligent enough, the average adult is intelligent enough to be able to 
select those who should lead society. Mm. Um, that that premise, one could argue, has has not been successfully fulfilled. Uh, and of course, um, for example, example, uh, America's founding fathers were against democracy. Thomas Jefferson worried about democracy being mob rule, and as it turns out, democracy has been a sinking to the lowest common denominator. You only have to look at the American presidents this century to realize that they haven't been up to snuff when it comes to meeting the challenges of the world. Well, uh, you write that uh, plutocratic capitalism showed itself to be an unsustainable regime, and when changing course became critical, democracy proved an anchor of conservative inertia. So political leaders knew that doom was impending, yet they attempted no remedy. Cowardice at the top crumbled civilization and crafted an inevitable end. I mean, it doesn't sound too encouraging, does it? No. um, All you have to do is read the news, and it's obvious that what I was stating was simple facts of what are going on. We've had what's called climate change, which is simply the most obvious um, aspect of Mm self-extinction, global global warming. Uh, That was known in the the 1930s. Um, It was first stated. President Johnson of the USA uh, had a report put on his desk in 1965 uh, that said, something's got to be done. Uh, Uthon, the Secretary General of the UN in 1969, warned that humanity only had about 10 years before things got out of control. The Club of Rome in 1972. uh, And yet, and there's been at least 28 um, climate conferences since, and even more conferences on biodiversity, uh, these other issues. Nothing effectual has been done. And of course, the problem is that in order to do something effectual, it requires a coordinated response. Nations have to agree, and they've been unwilling to do so. Uh, and that, of course, is because of plutocracy. Money talks, and the money wants to go with the status quo because that's where the profit is. Mm. Uh, you can't continue the current system and, and have the change necessary to counter what the current system has accomplished. Well, you know the old saying, money talks and bullshit walks, right? The story, this is John Kelly, John J. Kelly, a famous uh, free press writer from Detroit, gives you five stars, and here's why. He says, the story of humanity is an attempt to explain and illustrate how humans' laziness and inability to educate themselves and their communities led to their demise. So author Ishinobu paints a picture that includes the exploitation of of other human beings, the ignorance of science, and the ultimate end of humanity. This is a disturbing but necessary examination of both where we are as a species and how we are inevitably bound to self-destruct. He highly recommends the book. Now, when I go back into a chapter here, I was reading about, you touched on it before about females. You believe women were key to survival uh, Neoteny affected perception of bodily beauty, especially in males going back. Female faces that were more juvenilized were most appealing to men. Less Neoteny was uh, unattractive regardless of age. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Neoteny, I think I am. Uh, as a woman chose and made largely on concerns other than physicality, Neoteny was not nearly as looming an issue in the male allure. But then you go on to write uh, affected perception of bodily beauty and so on, especially in males. What what are you trying to explain there? That's about the aesthetics associated uh, with neotinny. And that's the, the facile point. The underlying point is that we're biologically driven. Um, and the problem as it extends from the physicality is that women were the ones, as I explained in the book, mm-hmm. uh, women's were, women were the ones who mastered the plants for medicines, for food, knew, knew which plants were nutritious, mm-hmm. um, who created all the crafts, uh, who domesticated the animals, including men. 
Um, <laughs> and what happened when agriculture, when we started growing crops, is it required physical labor. It required more physical strength, which was the one deficit that women had as compared to men. Women are most more sociable. They're not driven. Their idea of success, a woman's idea of success, and of course, keep in mind that modern women are different than women in ages past. The, the psychology, the social psychology has changed. Uh, women in ancient times, um, they wanted to craft a home. Uh, they wanted a pleasant social environment. They got along with each other. Uh, mm. And that sort of cooperative effort is what made humans be able to survive before technology made our lives so, so much easier. And that very cooperative urge that women have is what's essential now. Men want to succeed through ego-based pride and financial wealth, uh, I mean, you see that in the dynamic that occurs today. Mm -hmm. uh, that's no that's no formula for success for for a society. Well, you you wrote too in the book that the continuing psychosocial contention of individualism versus communalism uh, that was a key aspect of how human groups evolved. Uh, the schism sharpened in the last age. Then, while well, environmentally destructive technology, as you touched on, heightened the importance of cooperation and when you share that you're talking about exactly how i mean many animals use tools but the hominids seemed especially fond of them comparatively other primates use tools sparingly and you write that a host of adaptions improved dexterity loss of muscle mass enlivened imagination inclination to craft work it enhanced hominid ability to survive via the tools and weapons, right? But then you touched on the mental limitations. So explain that to us. The first point you make is that, in fact, technology was an adaptive measure. Uh, we had lessened physical strength, um, and that was compensated for um, by, any, by using tools more profusely. The other aspect, of course, is the imagination. And it's a wonderful tool to be able to envision what isn't in order to accomplish uh, things and, and create what can be. But there's a downside to it. Um, and that downside relates to how easily we believe and how gullible we are. Uh, that gullibility has a social advantage in that if we talk to each other, then we tend to believe one another, and uh, that helps us get along. Mm. Um, we're not very humans; are not very good at detecting lies. Uh, and oddly, as I mentioned in the book, uh, dogs are better at dealing <laughs> with liar, dealing with liars, and not believing liars. Humans will believe liars. We, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, are. Every day they've been in office or were in office, they lie profusely. Uh, when Trump was in office, um, there was the newspapers, especially the left-wing newspapers, uh, kept count of how many lies he told every day. Joe Biden, they don't bother to do that. Joe Biden lies as profusely as Trump does, except for Joe Biden has sweet lies. And so that, that's nice. You know, Joe Biden talks about progress and how we're dealing with the environment. Meanwhile, he's um, putting out more oil leases and proceeding with business as usual, but he's talking a nice game, so right, that's right. pleasant. Well, that, that gull sorry, that, that, gullibil that gullibility cuts against us. Um, we have religions that are ridiculous. Uh, what's essential to, if we talk about self, you know, if we pretend for a moment that we could change our fate, that humanity could survive, uh, of course, what would be necessary would be imagination, a vision of how can we do that? And how could we survive? How could we change the way we've, all of history is a continuum. You know, how could we turn the wheels of civilization now at the, at the mm. 11th hour? Yeah. And, and, and the answer is we did, we'd need a system that was communal, 
where we got along, where we shared resources, that we weren't so wasteful. And that cooperation requires a vision. It also requires a self-discipline. Um, we're too easily persuaded and we don't exercise enough vision with regard to what we should have done. And I don't think I'm explaining this well. No, you are. <laughs> you are underlying. And uh, what, yeah. I mean, look, you cast this natural history in the guise of science fiction. And I can understand why, you know, you've framed it in this perspective. There seems to be an overarching theme to the story of humanity. But in your mind, how and when did humanity go wrong? In the short time we've got left, I've still got a few questions I'd like to ask you, so answer them briefly for me, if you would. Yes. So, in your opinion, how and when did humanity go wrong? The tipping point was 1940, uh, when we went into the Second World War. Hmm. So, what role do you think technology has played in the course of human history and in the development of the critical state that we currently find ourselves in? Chemical pollution has been the sorest problem, uh, especially the use of biocides. We've killed off over 90% of the pollinating insects. Um, mm. Crops don't grow without those pollinating insects. Yeah, yeah I'm, <laughs> you're so spot on. I mean, this book prophesizes the self-extension of humanity. There's no doubt about it. Do you think there's still a window, though, in which... You know, how do we turn this around on a dime in which a swift change could be executed that might change the inevitable result? That would be a fantasy. There is, there is no reasonable scenario by which the wheels of civilization suddenly turn and do a 180. It's simply not going to happen. One only has to look at recent history in the past few decades to realize that nothing effectual is going to be done, not even attempted. <sighs> sad really but it's the truth i'm talking with the uh, ishinobu by the way it's ishinobu.com and the book is available on kindle and in paperback on uh, amazon and you can you know go over this interview as many times as you want on uh, mark bishop media and of course it'll be distributed out through platforms all across for the global reach so i mean uh, do you have any hopes that the story of humanity could serve perhaps as a wake-up call, is she, or, or part of a movement that might uh, wake humanity, you know, to our plight? I, I harbor no such hope. I, I wrote the book for my own entertainment, and I hope it entertains and enlightens others. I've gotten some positive reviews from readers. Uh, one reader recently said that it was life-changing for him, a, a young man, 23 years old. So... Hopefully it'll have some positive impact for people. Well, it's a great book, really. Uh, it's a book that you sit down and don't get disturbed with, I think. Uh, it has a documentary tone to it and a keen insight uh, into the psychological and sociological currents that have uh, culminated in humanity's current state. It's called The Story of Humanity, Ecology and Consequence, and it delves the roots and vector of a history. And Ishinobu skillfully explains how humanity got to where it is today, and quite frankly, where it's headed. He aims not at worldwide change, an impossibility, but instead seeing the story as a journey of realisation. The most you can do is enlighten yourself and see things as they are, says Ishinobu, not as you wish them to be. That's a very thought-provoking so if spiritualism had guided the course of history, Ishii, rather than, as you say, materialism, what do you think would be different today? I think the role would be completely different. Uh, I think we would have husbanded resources as occasionally has been done in societies. Um, I think women would have had equal, if not greater, status than men in societies, uh, I think we would have had an, an infinite and experience and very much more pleasant with practically no crime. I mean, pr private property is what creates crime. Hmm. Private property is what creates crime. Example? 
Well, imagine if everyone had enough to eat. Imagine if everyone had a fulfilling life. If if we if we handed out employment, not employment, but work to people according to what their aptitudes were. If we educated, um, if we were well educated, all of us, mm-hmm. uh, to the to the degree that we want to be in the ways that we want to be, people would lead lead fulfilling lives. They'd feel part of society, be happy to contribute to society, and and make efforts to do so. Um, it would simply be a different world, and it would be a much happier world. Uh, people feel calm, comfortable, blissful when they're in nature. And imagine if we were always in nature. Uh, it's these artificial urban environments that create stress. It's jobs that exploit others that create stress. Without these stresses, we have a much better society and we have much happier individual lives. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, it's all very logical when you think about it, the way you put it. Hmm. Well, I tell you what, this is a great Christmas gift when you think about it, folks. If you've been scratching your head, I'd get it. The Story of Humanity, Ecology and Consequence. All right, that's the name of the book, The Story of Humanity, Ecology and Consequence. And you can go straight to the author's website, ishinobu.com. Okay, Mark, get a pen. Okay, let me explain it for you. I-S-H-I-N-O-B-U, all together, ishinobu.com. And the book is available on Kindle and in paperback, of course, you know, on Amazon. Very thought-provoking, very deep. Uh, It crosses a lot of things. Just before you go, Ishi, do me one favor. Just name the books again, please, from scratch when you started, and basically what they're meant to do. I'm sorry, are you referring to all of my books? Yes, you've done how many? Twelve, right? Yes. Uh, The Red Pill, Mastering the Matrix, is the first in the current trilogy that I'm writing. Uh, The Story of Humanity, Ecology, and the Consequences, the second in the trilogy uh, that's currently being written. The next book in the trilogy, the conclusion of the trilogy, is called When Science is Fiction. Uh, That that should be out in 2024. The first books were Clarity, The Path Inside, uh, which is scientific spiritualism, although it's more philosophically oriented. The preface to the spoke cycle is called Unraveling Reality Behind the Veil of Existence, which presents scientific spiritualism, as I call it, uh, and explains the nature of reality. Clarity also does that. The Red Pill do that. They do so, each of those books, from distinct perspectives. The Red Pill, for example, is scientific spiritualism uh, written to a middle-grade reading level. Clarity is more philosophical. Unraveling reality is more science-oriented at a higher level than the Red Pill. The first book in this spoke cycle is the science of existence. It covers what I would call the hard scientist, and I say that simply because readers have told me it's the more difficult of the books. <laughs> it covers astrophysics, cosmology, physics, uh, the origin of life, abiogenesis, chemistry, and genetics. Um, understandably, you can see why that might be considered hard science. Sure, you, sec- know, you don't need 16 <laughs> degrees to read that one, you know, but go on. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the second book in the spoke cycle is The Web of Life. It's biology. It covers the biosphere, microbes, plants, animals. The third book is The Elements of Evolution. It covers the history of life on Earth, uh, how people, how uh, Philosophers, scientists have thought about evolution, their theories of evolution, such as Darwinism, Mm -hmm. uh, and then describes how evolution actually works. Uh, The fourth book is called The Ecology of Humans. It covers the human body, physiology, uh, energy system, health, diet, nutrition. The fifth book is The Echoes of the Mind. It describes the history of psychology. It has in it the history of psychology, describes the nature of the mind, uh, psychology, how consciousness and the mind interface, um, and also has at the the final chapter is on sociology, uh, 
cover sexism and other issues that are also discussed, of course, in the story of humanity. The sixth book is The Fruits of Civilization. It covers technology, specifically emphasis, specific emphasis on energy technology, energy production, uh, and such as fossil fuels uh, and computers. It has a history of economics um, and economic theories, how economics actually works, food production, and the final chapter is The Fruits of Civilization, which tells about the culmination of technologies and what they have done to the environment, which of course is covered again uh, in a more briefly in a slightly different context mm -hmm. in the story of humanity. The seventh book is The Pathos of Politics, uh, political history, political theory, how governments actually work, how justice systems uh, should work and how they actually work. And the last chapter is on you socialism, um, what it would take to govern a society in a way that would be just and su sustainable. The eighth book is the most science oriented and the deepest so far um, on scientific spiritualism. It explains using all kinds of sciences from physics to evolutionary biology to psychology, uh, the nature of reality, the, a proof, uh, an evidence-based proof for the paradigm that is the nature of reality, and then goes to describe um, elevation of consciousness from the state of ignorance to enlightenment to realization, has some history of spiritualism and uh, also biographies of gurus. Mm -hmm. And that concludes the Spoke series. Well, I tell you what, um, you sure you're not an alien, my friend? You know, <laughs> I, I'm I am only in a human body. I, I I I really don't identify. What a fascinating gentleman! I hope you enjoyed that. But before you go, I, I'd like you to hear this from Ishi. The current book, The Story of Humanity, is available in Kindle. And in paperback, the audio book will be out within a few months. I'm working on that now. All of my other books are available as open access PDFs. They're also available. You can read them online. They're available on a web page format. So the important thing to me was to have the information out there and to have people enjoy this reading experience. Dick, you're an incredible writer and... Uh... A man that makes a lot of people think. But this last book, I think, is uh, this is a winner. The Story of Humanity, Ecology, and Consequence. And the author is uh, Ishinobu. The best thing to do is all your books are on your site. So go to ishinobu.com. Uh, but this particular book is a gift for Christmas, perhaps, is on Kindle uh, and in paperback and Amazon. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. My head is still spinning. I've learned something, though, and it makes me uh, deeply think about uh, where on earth we are going. So it is a bit of a concern, really. People should take interest. Ishinobu, it's been a pleasure to have you on Nothing Like a Good Book. Thank you.